and continuing from death, mortality, and vitality. I stopped in the middle right after the Carla story, so we continue. Other survivors avoid living full and active lives, not only out of guilt, but out of fear. To live fully means to know not only life's joys, but its pains and disappointments as well. These individuals are so afraid of sustaining additional losses and enduring more suffering that they choose to sit on the sidelines and watch life be played by others. They may not score any touchdowns, but at least they do not break any bones or lose any points. C.S. Lewis talks of his own constriction during much of his adolescence and early adulthood as being a self-imposed armor designed primarily to allow him to stay safe from life's tragedies. In the fairy tale, through the Mickle Woods, a king in mourning for his queen embarks on a journey. The king is instructed to listen to the tales told by a bear in a dark cave. One of the stories is about a man who lives alone in the woods. He never sows his seeds in the spring because he fears the drought. He never travels because he worries that the ship might sink. One day he encounters a small bird and begins to engage the bird in a discussion about his own fears. He asks the bird if she is not afraid of the wind. The bird replies, of course I am. He then asks her if she is afraid of fire and once again she answers in the affirmative. Finally, he asks her why. If she is afraid of the wind and the fire, she still flies. There are things in life, she tells him, that she would not miss. The beautiful morning, the fledglings in the spring. If she did not risk the wind and fire in order to fly high, she would not have the things she loves about life. The bird tells the man, moreover, that both joy and sorrow are necessary for her song. Unlike the man who lives locked away, accompanied by only his fears, the bird takes risks because she wants to live life. For some, the fear is more explicit than just the pain and loss of living. The fear is specifically a fear of dying to begin to live is to allow the possibility that one will die. The 17th century verse concluded, concludes with the line, he that begins to live begins to die. To engage life in its fullest, to be open to all that life has to offer, is to acknowledge the reality and the inevitability of death. For some individuals, under living, the life that is not really life is an attempt to fool the angel of death. Just as the ancient Israelites smeared their door frames with blood so that the angel of death would pass over their homes, these survivors play possum so as to fool the angel of death. There is no reason for anyone to kill me if I have already killed myself. They say to themselves, the angel of death has better prey than to fix someone who is already dead. Tony's story. After his father's death, Tony's mother turned his father's office into a museum. Files remained in the drawer exactly as Tony's father had left them. His pipes stood neatly arranged in the pipe stand. The office remained untouched for almost 35 years. Even more tragically, the house in which Tony, his sisters, and his mother continued to live became lifeless. Tony's family stopped participating in the world. 
They never went to a park or a movie. Nothing that was just fun was a part of the routine of their lives. Tony's mother would frequently say, if your father had were alive, he would teach you how to live. She attended to the needs of her children. As far as food, clothing, and shelter were, in <clears throat> excuse me, were concerned. But beyond that, says Tony, she did not have a clue. Tony found some solace in the church school he attended. In contrast to his home, church and school seemed palpably alive, but the teachings of the church did not encourage him to be a passionate little boy. Tony remembers wanting to emulate all of the little saints, the perfect people who had been taken young and untainted to God. When Tony would recite the prayer to our Father in Heaven, he would think, I have two fathers in Heaven. God my Father and my very own Father, who is there waiting for me. In his fantasies, Tony would frequently refer to himself as Saint Tony. Even as a young boy, Tony became aware of the confusion that was building inside of him. The most alive people he knew were dead. The people he lived with on earth seemed like the walking dead. Only, Tony felt so tied to his mother and her lifeless life that if he went more than a half an hour away from her home, he would have an asthma attack and need to be brought back. Tony's forays into the world were limited by his pathological attachment to his mother and the mausoleum in which she lived. As he became a teenager, Tony became increasingly aware that I don't know how to live. I don't know how to have a good time. I don't know how to have fun with people. Tony realized that he could hide from life by working all the time. As a teenager, he was admired for being a determined entrepreneur. He worked three jobs simultaneously and attended church regularly. He was the most pious boy he knew. In his adolescence, Tony became aware that he was gay Yet, sexuality of any type seemed unimportant to Tony compared to his more overriding concern. How can I dare to be alive? Tony's mother had convinced him that life was dangerous, that the best way to continue breathing was to conserve your energy and not live much. As a late adolescent, Tony read biographies voraciously. He was an ardent reader, but more importantly, he was desperate for an example of how to live a life. He reasoned that his father had been a vital and alive man, yet his father had died. Being alive then must not be very safe. Whenever Tony felt a surge of passion or positive life energy, he became frightened and quickly returned to playing possum in the role of Saint Tony. When he left home to go to college, Tony was terrified that he did not know how to function. The world of college offered Tony an artificial infusion of liveliness. Drugs and alcohol were one way a deadened boy could feel alive. Not surprisingly, amphetamines became Tony's drug of choice. With speed in his veins, he could feel alive. 
even when there was terror in his heart. Tony recalls going home for vacations during college and watching his mother's reaction to his addiction. She had no problem when Tony was drinking and was dulled by the effects of alcohol. She was terrified, however, when Tony appeared sparkly and alive under the influence of speed. My mother could not handle it when I seemed jazzy, even if my aliveness came from chemicals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Awesome coffee cup I got for my son. It keeps my coffee warm when I try to do these readings. So, thank you, son. <laughs> he doesn't listen to this, so I guess it makes it better. Um. <sighs> Let's see, where was I at? In his late 20s, Tony joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and in the 12-step recovery program, he began to gain control over his addiction. Yet for Tony, sobriety was a mixed blessing. His first thought when he no longer took drugs was, Oh God, it's over. I'm closed off again. Tony has remained a committed participant in 12-step programs for more than 20 years. He realizes that at times he hides within these programs following the script of recovery rather than actively engaging his life. While he has had a few long-term relationships, Tony has been celibate for the last several years. AIDS gave me an excuse for staying away from sex. I'm chronically afraid of catching death. The AIDS epidemic has also caused Tony to confront the specter of death, which took his father away and terrified him. And for so many years, Tony believes that he has probably buried close to 300 friends and acquaintances. Death has knocked so consistently and loudly at Tony's door that he has been forced to hear the knock. At last, I had to confront my grief and mourn for my father. Through that, I think I have become more alive than at any other time in my life. Tony's aliveness has allowed him to recapture some of the joy he felt as a boy when he was first introduced to the spiritual world of the church. While his early passion for religion might well have stemmed from his fear of dying, Tony's current faith seems more real and more deeply felt. C.S. Lewis, who, like Tony, walked for years in the shadow of death, felt intense joy as he began once again to feel his feelings. For Lewis, joy led him to spirituality and to Christianity. At first, he merely experienced the excitement of his own aliveness. There was a transitional moment of delicious uneasiness, and then instantaneously, the long inhibition was over. The dry desert lay behind. I was off once more into the land of longing. My heart at once broken and exalted, as it had never been since the old days. Early loss may deprive some people of vital life energy. As with Tony, enthusiasm, vitality, and engagement 
fade in the wake of an early death. Others, however, feel inspired by early loss to live their lives to the fullest. Eleanor Roosevelt declared that one must never, regardless of the circumstances, turn turns one back. Hang on. Turn one's back on life. I'm going to read that again so it makes sense this time. Others, however, feel inspired by early loss to live their lives to the fullest. Eleanor Roosevelt declared that one must never, regardless of the circumstances, turn one's back on life. Roosevelt experienced many losses in her life, yet she remained committed to living fully and vitally. Now look at there. I'm gonna catch the birds flying in this morning. Early loss may deprive some people of vital life energy. Oh, read that one. After her mother's early death, America's material girl, Madonna, came to believe that life was too short to wait for what you want. She says, I want everything there is in life and love. Some survivors feel similarly, believing that the only lesson to be learned from premature death is that you must live life fully. One man commented, My only regrets are that I did not go more places or do more things when I was younger and could stay up all night. One cannot get too much of life, and the only regrets is to have not lived fully. Another woman recalls her father saying to her before he died, People's passions are what you will remember about them. You must be passionate about something in order to survive. She has taken her father's words to heart and lives her life with energy and enthusiasm. There is no time for not doing what you really want to do, she says. Charles believes he is living as his mother would have wanted him to when he says, I'm not going to spend my time worrying about what might happen or focusing on the bad. I just try to enjoy myself. The day after he learned of his mother's death, Charles joined a group of friends to play baseball. He remembers thinking that his mother would have approved of his decision. She was a fun-loving and somewhat mischievous woman who enjoyed the short life she had. Charles and his wife work hard, but they also play hard as well. Both have many hobbies and interests some of which they share, some of which they do separately. They are always on the go. Charles declares, we never run out of money. We only run out of time. He gets angry when he encounters friends who fail to appreciate the good things in their lives and only find something to complain about. Most people can't enjoy life for what it is. Let me give you an example. I'll be playing golf with somebody He's a good golfer, but he's having a bad day and he starts to complain. I want to grab him by the neck and say, you stupid idiot, you're playing golf. There are no bombs dropping on your head. Nobody's jumping out of the bushes to hurt you. You're playing golf and you're moaning. I can't stand that. Charles feels committed to enjoying himself, not only for himself, but also because he truly believes that to enjoy his life is the best way to honor his mother. The only legacy you have to leave is that you loved your life and that you had the best time you could have. Vitality is what distinguishes the living from the dead when one is vital. One is actively engaged in one's life, committed to participating in the world fully. For some individuals, early loss infuses them with the determination to live life with gusto and enthusiasm. I'm going to stop here. We're on page 212 of the book, The Loss That Is Forever by Maxine Harris, PhD. Uh, this chapter has been death, mortality, and vitality. The next section will be death is nothing to fear. And, um, oh, wow. And it is uh, three pages long, which I probably should have just went ahead and read it.
Okay, fine. I'll read it. Death is nothing to fear. Some individuals who have experienced early loss insist that, though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they fear no evil. In some cases, these individuals have come to believe that they have a friend on the other side. Death is not to be feared because it holds a reunion with a parent lost long ago. One man fondly recalls a song he used to sing in church as a boy. When I get to heaven, I'll meet my mother. He remembers that he took comfort in this song because he understood its message quite literally and believed then as he believes now. And when he finally dies, he will be reunited with his mother and at last have a chance to know the woman who was taken from him when he was just a boy. For some individuals, an anticipated reunion with the dead parent slips into a longing that begets suicide. One woman whose father had himself committed suicide felt no fear of dying because she was convinced that in death she would finally get to know her father. As a girl, she would often ask for information about her enigmatic parent. Her father was described as brilliant but troubled. And other than this cryptic epitaph, few people had any details about the man who had hung himself in their basement. In her early 20s, this woman made an unsuccessful suicide attempt. The overriding feeling I had which gave me the courage to do it was that I wanted to be with him finally. I wanted to go where he was so I could just know him. And that was in my head the entire day before I did it. She now believes that this aborted attempt actually did allow her to know her father. I am the only one of my brothers or sisters who has ever been suicidal, so I understand what he did in a way that I don't think you can, unless you have been suicidal yourself. She has made no subsequent suicide attempts, yet she continues to insist that she has no fear of death, because when she does finally die, she will be reunited with her father. For many who have lived a long life, an acceptance of the inevitability of death comes in their 70s or 80s. One looks back over years of struggles and accomplishments and feels satisfied with the result. If, however, because a parent died young, an individual only expects to live to 40 or 50, he or she might arrive at this late stage of life prematurely. As a man or woman still in midlife, the individual might come to an acceptance of death after what is believed to have been a full life. Several individuals who were in their late 40s and early 50s expressed a strong sense that they would accept death if it came. One woman asserted, I feel like I have lived through the major events of life. I have children. I've been a good mother. I had good and bad relationships. Been professionally successful and I have dealt with loss. There is nothing left now to do but just enjoy the rest of my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although she was barely 50, she felt that she had tasted life fully. She had seen both her mother and father die young and felt ready to accept death if it came her way. Another man maintained, there is a tragedy in dying. It is in dying too young. I feel like I have already lived a pretty full life. I don't want to die. Don't get me wrong, but I have the sense that death is a part of life. It is there. You accept it. This man, also in his 50s, had had a successful career and raised four children. Many people his age would be looking forward to a long and rich retirement. As the son of a man who had died quite young, however, he felt that he had already had more than his share of living. Another man who suffered a heart attack in his 30s also expressed an acceptance of death as part of the natural rhythm of life. I'm not afraid of dying. In fact, I've had to face it fairly realistically. I feel comfortable with the reality of it. It's not that I'm ready to die. I just don't have any fear of it. 
I'd like to hang around and see a couple of grandchildren and have a few more enjoyable years, but it wouldn't really bother me if I couldn't because my life hasn't been that bad, that short, or that unfulfilled. John Paul Sartre, in commenting on the death of a young colleague, maintained that every life is complete at its end. A full life has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It does not have a pre preset duration. When it reaches the end, it is complete. Some individuals who had experienced early loss felt the same sense of completion in contemplating their own lives and their own longevity. Although they were all but mo by modern standards individuals who might expect to live many more years, those who had come to accept death had somewhat precociously reached the final stage of adult development, the stage of integrity, in which one comes to one's life as an integral whole, meaningful and sensible in itself. <clears throat> Folklore and fairy tales are filled with images of death, usually depicted as an old, decrepit, deceitful monster. Yet no life passes without making the acquaintance of death. There is a Buddhist parable in which a woman runs to the Buddha after the death of her young son. She is weeping and devastated and pleads with the master to restore her son to life. The Buddha tells her that he will gladly help her. But first, she must obtain four pomegranate seeds from a home that has not known death. Initially, she is elated and proceeds to scour the town in search of a family free of death, where she might obtain what she needs. Of course, she is unsuccessful. No home has not known death. And in time, she comes to realize the wisdom of the Buddha's lesson. The person does not exist who has been untouched by death. Yet for most people, death does not make an appearance until an individual has enjoyed a life, a full life. We are spared, we are spared having to deal with loss and tragedy until we are better able to handle the trauma of death. When people meet death in childhood, it marks them. Often they change the way they understand their own lives, the way they perceive time, and the way they move through the life cycle. They also alter their view of death itself. Death is no longer a mere character in a story, but a very real presence that has robbed them of something precious and dear. say that one is marked by early loss may sound dramatic and perhaps extreme. Survivors of early loss do not look different from the rest of us. Their loss is invisible and unseen by most of us. Yet it was surprising how many people I interviewed had come to love and share their lives with another survivor of early loss. It was as if each did indeed bear a mark, perhaps only visible to another survivor, but a mark nonetheless, recognizable and clear to one who had been through the same experience. In Ben Heck's words, these were all people who had been to the edge of the world and looked over its last foot of territory into nothingness. That was page 215. The next part will be part three called The Next Step. And that will be chapter nine, Acts of Repair. Thank you again. I appreciate you. Thanks for being with me and seeing the birds. I hope you got a chance to see the giant flock in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much.